Hey everybody, today's video is about the electrical system that's going on in this van I've been working on. The entire thing is essentially housed in this kind of base cabinet here that's going underneath my sofa and bed system. And there's a ton of videos like this on the internet already, so let me just quickly cover a few reasons why this video will be unique. Up first, I've decided to assemble my own battery using lithium iron phosphate cells. You can buy these cells considerably cheaper than you can buy pre-made batteries. And essentially by buying eight 280 amp hour cells, I've been able to assemble one 560 amp hour 12 volt battery. Next, I'm using a battery management system or a BMS that is compatible with Victron components. I'm a big fan of Victron batteries and their BMS, but they are really expensive. So this way I can essentially still get all the function and fun capabilities of Victron components, but I'm not married to their batteries. Third, this system also has additional capabilities like activating a heater for my water system when we are in close to freezing conditions, as well as progressively disconnecting certain loads throughout the van when my batteries are close to being totally depleted. And finally, I think this system for how I like to camp and how I like to use my van strikes a great balance of being automated and informative. And what I mean by that is it's automated. I can leave it, I can forget about it, it will take care of itself. But if I am curious, you know, how much solar charging I've been getting or what temperature my batteries are at, I've got a bunch of utilities to be able to track that easily. And to keep this video reasonably long, this is not a how-to video. This is gonna be more of kind of a deep dive into the logic, the functions, and the capabilities of the system, but we are not gonna have time to cover exactly how to assemble this. If you're familiar with 12 volt wiring, um, I think you'll be able to fill in a lot of the gaps yourself. But if you are new to this, um, it's gonna be a little bit overwhelming if, if you don't have some back knowledge. So unfortunately, there's just not gonna be enough time to keep this video reasonable and cover all of that. To stay on track, let me just quickly go over what's gonna be covered in this video. We're gonna start with just a quick system overview about like, all the major components that will just provide context as we continue going in this video. Then I'm gonna just quickly talk about assembling your own battery bank and how much it costs me. Um, this is not gonna be a tutorial on how to build one, but I do just need to point out a few things so we can understand the rest of the system. That will take us right into what a battery management system does and which of its functions I think are absolutely critical in like a mobile camper van setup. And once we've kind of covered those things, we kind of have the foundation. I'm gonna do kind of a very thorough explanation of exactly how I've programmed and set this system up to do what I want it to do. Now, at that point, if you're still awake, um, we're gonna just kind of talk about the pains and like the nitty gritty details that I encountered while trying to set this up. There was some frustrations with the Rec A BMS and there was just a few other speed bumps that if you're interested after watching the start of the video to try to replicate this, I think these are just some headaches that I hope to save you. So let's get started. So let me just try to draw this out in the simplest terms I can. At kind of the heart of the system, we've got the battery and we've got a battery management system or BMS that essentially functions as a bodyguard for that battery. If anything is gonna to try to hurt the battery, the BMS is there to prevent that. And one of the tools that the BMS uses in this setup is called the Victron Servo GX. This is essentially a communication hub that serves a few different purposes, but the two main ones for this setup is that it commands the rest of the Victron components. So if the BMS wants something to happen, it will tell the Servo GX and the Servo GX will tell that command to the other Victron components. The other thing that the Servo does is you can plug a display into it. And with that, you can just have great knowledge of what is going on with your system and set a lot of the parameters. And then there are all the other components which are essentially either charging or discharging the battery. We've got the solar charge controller which takes the input from the solar panels and essentially converts it into the proper voltage to charge our batteries. When we're driving, we've got our alternator working in the engine and through a Renogy DC-DC 60 amp converter, um, we're essentially charging our battery bank as we drive. And then the third charging source actually comes from our Victron MultiPlus. Now this is an inverter slash charger. So when we're plugged into shore power, it will charge the battery. But when we're not plugged into shore power, the MultiPlus is actually discharging the battery because it converts the 12 volt DC into 110 volt AC, which we use for things um, most importantly, like the induction stove in this van. And then there are the other discharge sources, which is essentially any other accessory or component you've got wired in the van. This will make sense later, but I'm gonna group these into three things. The first one I would call critical 12 volt loads. Then I've got accessory 12 volt loads. 
and then I've got the air conditioner. All right, and before we can get into this any deeper, I've got to just quickly talk about relays because there's actually three different kind of ways that the term relay will be thrown around in this video. First, there's just the traditional like little 12 volt automotive relay. These are just a very basic component wiring systems and you can find them in most like auto parts stores. The most simple way I try to explain this is this is essentially like an electrically controlled switch. It has a signal or like a trigger input. And when you apply a little bit of power to that, it closes a larger switch that essentially then provides power for a larger device. These automotive relays, most commonly the small ones you get are rated to about 30 amps max capacity. So in this system, I've actually got things like the air conditioner and some other things that draw more power than that. So I am using something called Victron battery protects for those loads. Um, these can be set up in like an auto voltage sense kind of way, but in my setup, I'm just basically using them as like higher amperage relays. They've got also a signal wire, and when you signal it on, then it closes the contacts and allows the devices to draw power. And when you don't want that thing to have power because of the hub you programmed it, it opens up that connection, and then all those devices do not receive power from the battery. And finally, we've got something that is called programmable relays. And this comes into play with both our battery management system and our Servo GX. Now, these are not the kind of relays we were just talking about that can handle this larger 30 or 65 amp load. These are essentially just those trigger signals. So when you program it to have this programmable relay on, that will then essentially send that trigger signal to an external relay. So we've essentially got the battery protects and the regular automotive relays. And then we've got these programmable relays and all of that is pretty critical to make those distinctions for how the system operates. All right, so now let's talk about assembling your own battery bank. Um, my battery bank is assembled out of eight individual 280 amp hour cells. Um, each cell produces about three and a half volts. So if you wire four of them in series, you could get essentially a 12 volt battery. Since I have eight cells, I've got this wired up in what is called a 2P4S configuration meaning essentially two parallel, four series. So each pair of cells that are wired in parallel produce essentially one three and a half volt, 560 amp hour unit. And if you take four of those pairs and wire them in series, you will make one 12 volt, 560 amp hour battery. And when you're building your own battery, or even if you buy lithium iron premium batteries, most people will recommend you use a battery management system. Now, it is pretty easy without a battery management system to see what the voltage is across the whole 12 volt battery. Now, the big advantage of the BMS is that it has the ability to monitor the voltage of each cell. This way, even if the voltage of your battery looks good, if you have a cell that's quote unquote unhealthy, so it's either being overcharged or maybe it is being over discharged, it can actually pay attention to that and prevent that cell from being damaged. So while your traditional kind of battery monitor might disconnect your battery at let's say 11 and a half volts because you've selected, this thing will be able to disconnect your battery when one cell has reached like a critically low level. And that is just a great way to protect your battery so that no cell is harmed. Now, before we get too much further into what the BMS does and how it works, let's quickly talk about the cost to build your own battery bank. To get eight of these EVE 280 amp hour lithium cells, I paid just under $1,300. Um, there's varying opinions on the internet whether buying like grade B cells is actually bad or not. So that is a way to save even more money. I chose to buy the grade A cells, but that is just food for thought in case you're looking into this. I needed to buy some additional bus bars to connect all my cells together, which was right around $50. And then I needed my battery management system and I went with the REC ABMS specifically designed for Victron components. And this cost me $846.87 with the programming software. Even with the programming software, I ended up paying REC in Slovenia about 40 additional dollars for a little bit of reprogramming for a grand total of $2,222. So if we compare that price to some other reputable brands out there, I'm essentially paying just under $4 per amp hour if we look at like an offering from Battleborn to buy five of their 100 amp hour batteries, we'd pay just under $4,400 for that, which is about $8.80 per amp hour. And if we bought five 100 amp hour Victron batteries, we'd be at $5,400 or about $10.80 per amp hour. That said, if you went with a Renergy product, 
I haven't had the best luck with all Red Energy products, but even in this van, I am using their DC to DC converter. You can get some of their products that are down to about, I think the $5 per amp hour range. So that savings that used to be huge, you know, has really come down as lithium prices come down over the years. So let's get back to talking about that battery management system. And we've already touched upon the fact that the BMS is monitoring the cell voltages to prevent damage from your battery. But I think it's most important function in a camper van setup like this is that it is monitoring temperature. And what we're specifically worried about here is that lithium batteries should not be charged in below freezing conditions. And unless you live in an extremely temperate climate, you know, during the winter months, your van will see sub freezing temperatures. So why did I decide to use the REC Active BMS or ABMS as kind of the, the control point for my battery system? Well, if you go back to the initial table I made with all the charging and discharging components, um, if we had a kind of a disconnected system where the BMS did not talk to the rest of the components, if the temperature was dropping, I would be left in this place where I didn't really have a way to monitor what my BMS was thinking, and it could just arbitrarily disconnect all my charging. This was kind of coupled by the fact that my inverter, which is responsible for my induction cooktop, is also my shore power charger. So you can figure out systems to kind of shut down your inverter if it's uh, too cold for the shore power to work, but at the same time, then I wouldn't be able to cook. So by being able to integrate and have communication between all my devices, if my BMS decides it's too cold, it can independently tell the servo to have the shore power not charge, but the inverter will still continue to invert so that I can continue to have full function within the van. As well, through the Servo GX screen, I can monitor what is the voltage of my highest and lowest cells. I can see what my battery bank temperature is at all times. And for me, you know, these are things you may not want to know, but I do think that if you find yourself camping a lot in the winter or you've ever had any electrical issues, it's just way easier to be able to get this information if you want. So I was just really happy to know that I have this information if I need it and through all the other kind of options out there, although some of them were definitely cheaper, I feel like this provided me just the most control and understanding of how, what my system is doing. All right, so that kind of lays out the foundation of like everything that I needed to explain. And now let us talk about exactly how I've got this set up. Because we've just been talking about these really basic functions so far, like prevent discharging and prevent freezing. But let's talk about how that actually plays out in my setup. So there's essentially five tasks that I wanted the system to pull off and let's just go through them. First is the obvious, disable charging when necessary. That's when those temperatures are getting too cold. That is my big concern in this van. But how do you prevent these temperatures from getting too low on a regular basis? Is you'll probably have a battery heater. So I want it to be able to enable or turn on a battery heater automatically when necessary. The other problem with freezing conditions is you might freeze your water system. So I also wanted an automatic water system heater when necessary. And with the way my van is laid out and the fact that batteries will produce a little bit of heat just when they're powering devices, there'll often be times when your battery bank is gonna stay warmer than your water system. So I needed these two heaters to kind of function independently. Another function I wanted is in the summertime use, we use an air conditioner in our van and air conditioners are power hogs. So I wanted it to automatically turn off my air conditioning circuit when we're down to you know maybe about 25% capacity left. And if something was happened or maybe wherever we're camping, we're just not getting any solar charging, we're not moving the van. I wanted my battery system to automatically disable what I would call all my 12 volt accessories, which are things like, um, you know, my uh, stereo, my fridge. I want all of that shut off when we're at like a critically low state of charge so that things like my Servo GX and my battery and water heaters continue to stay awake, uh, stay powered as long as possible. And we're not wasting electricity on those other components. So how do we automate these five tasks? Between the REC Active BMS and the Servo GX, we have some basically programmable outputs. Uh, the REC ABMS has what they call their charging relay and then two things called optocouplers or programmable optocouplers. We're gonna cover my frustration about the REC ABMS at the end of this video, but for idiots like me, the relay and the optocouplers function the same. But if you are to go to talk to REC, about this product to them. They will refer to it as the charging relay and then the optocoupler one and optocoupler two. Then on the Servo GX, it has two programmable relays and we'll just call these the Servo Relay one and Servo Relay two. 
and between essentially these five programmable outputs, let's see how we can program the system to automate. So let's start with the first thing, which is to disable our charging when necessary. Now to make this work, I'm gonna utilize direct charging relay, but that is only gonna be for the alternator charging. In the REC programming, you can set the under temperature charging disable via the software. And I set mine at two degrees Celsius. So this charging signal will essentially turn off at two degrees Celsius saying it's not okay to charge. And then we'll reconnect at four degrees Celsius when the battery bank has come back up. Now for the shore power and the solar charging, the Serbo GX is controlling those components. So it will tell them to not charge when the temperature is low. However, for the alternator charging, this was a little more complicated. At the time I was buying components here in late 2022, early 23, Victron still does not make a DC-DC converter um, that can talk to the Serbo. And uh, they only have a 30 amp unit. So I actually ended up going with a 60 amp Brennage unit. Now in order to control it, you can use what is called the D plus terminal, which is essentially an ignition on signal from the engine. And the Sprinter makes this really easy because it has a D plus terminal right under the driver's seat. So the way I've got this wired up is through essentially one of those basic 12 volt automotive relays I was talking about earlier. So I am using the D plus signal from the Sprinter as the trigger source to essentially close the relay and it will close the signal that is coming through the REC charging relay port. This way when the ignition is off, the relay is essentially open. And if the ignition is on, but the conditions are not appropriate for charging, even though the Sprinter D plus signal will close the relay, there will be no power coming from the ABMS so that it will not enable charging in the DC-DC converter. Up next, let's talk about getting my battery heater to operate when we are nearing that two degrees Celsius mark. To make this happen, I actually ended up utilizing the REC Optocoupler 1. And this did require me to pay REC about $40 to have the firmware modified. But as a result, I can now set a connect and disconnect port for this optocoupler, which essentially functions like another programmable relay. So I've currently got it set that anytime the temperature drops under four degrees Celsius, my battery heater will turn on. And when that temperature has rebounded up to six degrees Celsius, the heater will turn off. And just to reiterate, you cannot pass the current of that heater through the REC BMS, through this REC optocoupler port, but you can use this output to trigger the relay that will fire the heater. And then as we touched on, we've also got our water heater. Now here I am going to be using the Serbo Relay 2, and another bonus to the Serbo is that you can wire in some temperature sensors to it. So I've actually got a temperature sensor that I've run over to where my water tank will be and it will be just fixed against the side of the water tank. And when the temperature of the tank drops below 37 degrees Fahrenheit, I will have my water heater automatically turn on. And when the temperature goes back up above 41 degrees, that water heater will turn off. And just like the REC ABMS, these servo programmable outputs are again, just the signal wires to essentially fire external relays. All right, which just leaves us with our last two things that I wanted, which is to have my air conditioner turn off and then to have my 12 volt accessories turn off. So in the summer, to have my air conditioner turn off when we're down to about 25% battery capacity, I will be using Servo Relay 1. And this is essentially gonna be like the trigger signal for a 65 amp hour Victron battery protect. So essentially you can set these relays in what they call generator mode. And these traditionally would be used that if your battery is really low, it will fire up a generator but you can actually kind of invert that behavior. And I've got this set to quote, run the generator anytime the battery is above 25% state of charge. Um, and this way, once it drops below that 25%, my air conditioner will turn off. And the fifth and final parameter was to basically disconnect all the non-critical loads when we're very close to completely depleting the battery bank. To do this, I'm gonna be using the REC optocoupler number two. Now the REC ABMS is already programmed to disconnect the battery if any individual cell goes below 2.9 volts. So to just have this be as a complete last line of defense, this is gonna disconnect all my accessories when any cell reaches 2.95 volts. And it is set up to automatically reconnect all these things once all our cell voltages return to 3.1 volts. So anyways, that's kind of how I've automated my system. This being my third van I've built out for myself, this is gonna perform exactly how I've always wanted. And now, if you're still interested, please stick around. 
as there will be maybe a little bit of colorful language as we cover some of the shortcomings with the ABMS or maybe some of the hurdles you got to jump over. At least I didn't know about up front. All right, so to start this section off, I would just like to say one last thing about how I've got this wired. You see, I've got my two relays here for my battery and water heater. So when the either the servo or the BMS decides that it's appropriate conditions for those heaters to be turned on, um, these relays essentially send that last power out to those heaters. But there's gonna be times when you don't want those heaters to fire, for instance, if you've winterized your water system or perhaps you've just got a really you know, short little cold spell so you don't really care if the battery heater kicks on. So in order to be able to essentially override those relays, that last kind of power run out to those heaters is wired through a switch that kind of looks like this. Um, and this is mounted on my wall so I can turn this on basically for the winter when I'm using the van so the heaters will be activated. But if I wanna leave the van and I don't want the heaters on, I just turn these off. The other bonus I like here is you've got this illuminated ring so if you're just sitting there and you're curious whether your heater should be on, if you click this to turn on and the, you, the heater is supposed to be running, this ring will illuminate because the switch is getting power. But if it's still too warm for your heaters to run, this ring won't be on. So that's just like a quick and easy way to see if your heater is on or not. All right, so let's dive into some of the frustrations with this REC ABMS. And I'm gonna just come out and say that I think one of the worst things about it is the manual. To me, it seems like it is written from one engineer to another without really considering maybe how stupid an end user is. Um, it's pretty rare for me to be kind of stumped by the wiring schematics or what they're trying to imply. You know, these days I feel like I can understand most wiring diagrams, but there is just some great inconsistencies and uh, just some real, you know, highbrow tech talk in this manual that I think is not helping end users actually know what the hell is going on. First and foremost, I joke, you should print this thing in black and white. Let me show you. Figure nine, someone has taken the time to color code these terminals red and black, which even in the rest of this manual, like the page before, implies that red is positive, black is negative. However, in this graphic, it's backwards. And in other places in this manual, they'll use this little T connection to imply a ground or I believe a chassis connection. Um, which I think is synonymous with what we use as this ground symbol um, in most like North American literature. Now, most of my frustration with this product can all be uh, boiled down to what is called the digital outputs figure seven page. If you study this graphic, it implies to me that pins 17 and 15 are to be grounded. They've got that T symbol and they're labeled black. Pins 16 and 14 are red, implying a positive connection. To add to this, you've got these things, VSS1, VSS2, and then VCC2 and VCC1. As you see, the numbers do not line up, so it's almost implying that you are jumping across pins and these aren't paired together. Thankfully, there's a wiring pin out earlier in the manual, so this, I believe, is just incorrect. But nowhere in this manual is it defined what VSS or VCC1 is. And the way this is color-coded, to me, implied that you are to ground pins 17 and 15, and then you will get a positive signal out on pins 16 and 14. Well, turns out that's completely wrong. This is essentially just a through connection. So if you apply positive 12 volts on uh, pin 17, you will get a positive 12 volts out on pin 16, same with 15 and 14. However, even the way the top of this is written, digital outputs are implemented with galvanic isolation. Optocouplers with diode reverse protection are used. When closed, a 0.7 voltage drop over the digital output should be taken into account. Um, you know, I think there's just a way to make this page kind of actually, you know, sing the praises of the fact that you have these digital like relays you can control. But the way this is written, the fact that the variables are not defined, the fact that the colors are fucked up, this is one of the most uh, frustrating points in this whole setup was trying to understand what this meant, especially when, um, you know, I would email them and they kind of give me these answers back that I feel like we're just con continuing to kind of like stroke off their engineering knowledge and not just giving me the end user what I needed. All right, and then I've only got one other major gripe with the REC ABMS, and that is the nine pin connectors they send you. Um, and you essentially have two of these connections you need to make. 
one to your computer if you want to program it, and one that will live forever in your installation between the REC ABMS and the Serbo GX. And with all the engineering in this product, how could you not fucking mail out connectors that are actually connectable? They all have these screws and none of them are the nut end. This just totally implies to me that you've got a bunch of engineers creating a product and they are not in the field or in the real world using it. These things rattle loose incredibly easily. How can you not fucking spec the connector that you need? This would literally cost a couple pennies, maybe. Anyways, I ended up buying some of these standoff nuts to be able to connect this, but this is just like disappointing. What are you expecting? People to just like tape these together? It's just such a dumb oversight for a relatively very advanced product. Oh yeah, and then I did forget one last thing about the REC ABMS that was extremely frustrating. Um, nowhere in the manual does it say this, but if you are using their PC software, you may have to actually reboot using this like manual on off switch, the actual unit for those changes to take place. Otherwise it won't work. This was extremely problematic when I was trying to get the ABMS to communicate with the servo because you have to change the transmission speed. But even though you send a command to the REC BMS telling that to be changed and it replies that it has changed it, you need to physically power cycle the unit for those changes to take place. This isn't mentioned in the manual and that caused me some frustration. All right, so those are my two big gripes with the REC ABMS. Um, so I'm just gonna quickly cover maybe four other landmines that if you're doing this, I would tell you to be aware of. First off, if you're connecting your own battery cells together, really pay attention to what amperage your bus bars are rated to. The ones that came with my battery were rated to 300 amps each. Seeing as my um, inverter is fused at 400 amps, I just needed to end up doubling all these bus bars, which is just something to take into consideration because it is cheaper to just buy these all up front with your batteries. So pay attention to what bus bars you get and what they're rated to. Up next, if you read this REC ABMS manual, it does not imply that you need a main fuse between essentially your contactor and your battery. In an online post, I found that REC BMS did say that in a future version of the manual, they will include that, but I would highly recommend you look into a main fuse uh, to put right off the battery post. And then if you really geek out about this, turns out if you have too high of a voltage, fuses can actually fail. So they most recommend these type T fuses that are hellishly expensive, but they are rated to 20,000 volts. So I've got a 450 amp fuse basically connected right to the positive terminal of my battery bank. And this is sort of, uh, you know, all hell's broken loose. Maybe I've gotten T-boned in the van or maybe I'm rolling it over and this is just the last disconnect for safety. Another th thing that caught me by surprise is if you're gonna hook up the Victron temperature sensors to your Servo GX, these actually um, are not as accurate as I expected and you may need to offset the readings a little bit. This caught me by surprise uh, but at first the temperature readings I was getting from my water tank uh, were implying that it was about 10 degrees warmer than it was. So it's good I caught that now because if it wasn't going to turn on my battery heater till my battery, until my water tank was at 28 degrees Fahrenheit, I would have been long frozen by then. All right, and I just got one last little kind of brain teaser and that has to do with these little automotive relays. Now these are extremely simple, but I got to note that in order to, you know, when you send that trigger, signal in to actually close this contact to provide power to a device. These do consume power. Um, it's a tiny little bit, usually somewhere between 0.2 and 0.3 amps, depending on you know, which relay you get. But if you've got a van you know, with five or more relays and you've got them all simultaneously closed, you could have this like parasitic draw of like one or two amps. So if you go back to that diagram I drew out about how I've got my alternator charging set up, you will note that this relay is only closed when the ignition is on, and that was on purpose. Because the if you had flipped essentially the signal wire or the trigger wire and like the power source, then this relay would just sit there closed all the time, essentially waiting for the ignition to provide power. But instead, it's more efficient to wire it that the relay sits open all the time only when the ignition is on does it close. So that's just like a 
fun little food for thought thing. If you're wiring things up, always keep in mind that you can be more efficient if you use these relays properly. Anyways, thanks so much for watching this. Um, I hope you learned something. I, you know, I'm very happy with the way this battery system is performing, but it definitely was more work than just buying something that's more plug and play. So thanks for your time and thanks a lot for watching.